Great, cool. thanks. Thank All right, thank you for having me. Sorry for the mess up. Um, so uh, I've been working in, in data storage since 1981. Um, and when Henry said that all my data was going to go away when we got to Exascale, I was back there applauding silently because I'm tired. Um, so I've been fighting the, the battle of moving data around for a long, long time. And it seems like we finally kind of have that on the run with burst buffers and lots of flash and all kinds of technologies like that. And so finally, we're going to get to move to metadata. And they said they were going to give a session about metadata here, and so I thought I would give this talk. Um, this is a random set of topics that we've been working on in the metadata area, and um, so I'll be talking about a random set of things, so don't think that they necessarily fit together. The one thing I'll point out on this slide is that there's this thing called EMC3. That is a efficient um, mission-centric computing consortia that we're putting together. Um, and it was mentioned earlier this morning that, that uh, HPCG over RMAX is interesting. And why can't we buy another K computer, please? And stuff like that. And that's essentially what that effort is about. It's trying to figure out how to bring um, technologies to problems of interest instead of trying to bring problems of interest to technologies. It's a subtle difference, but um, an important one. And we think it's worth doing. So moving on, um, I never know who knows what Los Alamos does and, and who, who knows uh, who doesn't. Oftentimes, the the crowd is younger than this crowd, so I'll probably skip over what this is about other than we're responsible for 80% of the stockpile of the US arsenal. Um, and we have to certify that every year and figure out if it's gonna work and if it's safe and all that kind of stuff. That's all done primarily with non-critical non experiments and with computation, lots of computation. Um, we've been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, first machine we had at Los Alamos was Maniac. Before that, we had people pushing calculators. Um, and lots of machines since then, some very interesting projects. Stretch was a very interesting project. Um, it became what was now, what, what eventually became known as the IBM 360, 370 series came out of that project that we did with IBM. And lots of other interesting projects along the way. C CM5 and the CM2 were interesting. CM2 is a 64,000 processor machine. The, the processors were one bit wide. We talked about about one byte um, integers today, and uh, that was one bit. So you could build a vector length of any length you wanted. It was kind of kind of neat. Actually, Danny Hillis lives in Santa Fe, so he's the guy that invented it. Um, and so anyway, lots of interesting machines all the way down to we've got a D-Wave down here um, as well that we're playing with. Um, and another uh, example of we've been at this a while, so we're, we're working on a, a, a scanning of all of our artifacts in high performance computing at LAN. We've been doing it longer than pretty much anybody. And so we thought we would start saving some of the artifacts from our world. And we scanned, this is, this is about a three year old chart. We scanned about 300,000 documents. Um, and you used to be able to buy a, a $10 million CDC supercomputer in, in the 1960s for, with one page. You, you fill out a page and you'd send it to ERTA and ERTA would send, would send the bill or send the PO to CDC and CDC would ship you a machine. And of course, procurements aren't that way anymore and the government takes a few more pages than one. Um, but anyway, this is interesting. We found this in our archives and we found lots and lots of stuff in the archives. Um, this is a, the letter from our procurement organization to Mr. Cray to buy the first Cray, which came in and didn't work because um, we were at a higher altitude than they were in Minnesota, and so they had to sh we had to ship the memory back and get get it uh, fixed so that it would correct itself. Six months later, we had the first query up and running uh, with our own operating system because it didn't come with one. Anyway, um, enough with that. So I, I date myself a lot here. Um, I, I wasn't actually here when we had the photo store. There was four of those in the world. That was an interesting uh, technology. Um, it wrote data onto little cellophane strips and um, burned it in. So it was ones and zeros essentially burned in barcode on cellophane and a little bit like micro, microfish. And that was a robot that ho held all of those. And, and IBM thought that they would ever build four of those and that was all the data there'd ever be in the world at that time. And um, my predecessor's predecessor used to tell me that when he'd come into work and the place smelled like burned plastic, um, that had a good night of computing because they decided to actually save stuff onto this device. And that, of course, it basically burned plastic to, to store the data. 
A lot of these things came from DOE or DOE investments or were influenced by DOE investments. Interestingly enough, Panassas was started about a, a mile from here um, at the Courtyard Marriott in 1999. Um, Garth came up to me after me yelling and screaming about how we needed a global parallel file system and, and said, gosh, we've got an idea. Do you want to you know, give us some money to get this going? Um, Luster came out of that same um, meeting, so Peter Brom came up to me and said, hey, I've got an idea, we should talk. And so it seems like every time I yell and scream and wave my arms, odd things happen 10 years later. So maybe I'll do that today and see if 10 years later we'll get something interesting. Um, but lots of things have happened. For example, Seth, you know, I was in a, a Denny's eating pie with Lee Ward and it's in Santa Cruz and we came up with this idea of let's fund the university to do a, a uh, user space object prototype uh, file system that we can play with scalable metadata in. Um, and so uh, that's what we did and you know, Seth came from that. So interesting stuff. I got stories of all, from all of these. Um, Oh, they wanted to talk, me to talk about metadata, and I decided I would start with something we did quite a while ago. So we built this thing called a um, campaign store, and the software is MARFS, stands for C in Spanish, so a C of data. Um, and we wanted scalable metadata to sit on top of objects, and we couldn't seem to find a reasonably good solution for that. And by scalable, you know, we're talking, you know, billions or tens of billions of files, or maybe more. Um, and, and hundreds of gigabytes a second, not terabytes a second, not real fast, just fairly fast. And we couldn't really find a product, so we kind of had to write one. We didn't really write the whole thing. We leveraged a lot of things, but the way we built a namespace is very similar to the way Lustre's DNE1 and DNE2 are, if you're familiar with that. And DNE1 is actually this, this namespace decomposition idea where you break up the, the namespace across multiple servers and um, then you split up the files within the directories in a hash mechanism across multiple servers. And so I, we, were, we were dismantling a machine a few years back called Cielo, it was a 9,000 node machine. And whenever we dismantle a machine, we always have a contest to see how, who can have the best idea for beating the hell out of the machine before it leaves to just make it crater before, before it gets shipped away to Texas to be buried. Um, and uh, the, the idea was, let's, let's figure out what it would be like to have a 9,000 node metadata server. Now that's kind of absurd, right? It's, it's a little silly, but we decided to do it, so we set up this, this RFS on top of our 9,000 node machine and set them all up to be metadata servers and broke the metadata up across those servers and in the way that it's depicted here. And um, my goal was to reach um, a million inserts, or a billion inserts a second um, and um, a trillion files in a single directory. Now that's pretty absurd, but of course there's 9,000 machines, so why not go for the gusto, right? And of course my people never can seem to get me the numbers I want. They only got 835 million inserts a second, which is pretty close to a billion a second. And they got something like 900 and some um, billion files into one directory before the machine cratered. And of course then we just decided we'd light it on fire and send it away. And so that was very interesting, and it was an interesting exercise in how, how far you could scale metadata. Um, a billion a second is really pretty fast. Um, but then let's get a little bit more serious about the efforts we're working on now. So um, there's three efforts that we're working on I want to cover, um, and the first one is Delta FS, and it says best paper, SC18, and why is that important? Well, it's important because it was the first paper ever that was an I.O. storage paper that ever got best paper at supercomputing. And supercomputing has been around for a while. It has 30 year anniversary. Um, I've been to all of them but one and I was sick, sick that year. But um, anyway, that's kind of interesting, right? That the best paper from supercomputing was a storage paper. It's very unusual. Um, and then, um, so let's, I'll go ahead and talk about Delta FS. So Delta FS is um, an effort that um, we cooked up when I was in, at CMU um, having a meeting with Garth. We funded CMU for years and I waved my arms and I said, Garth, why do I need metadata servers? I've got computers up the wazoo. I've got 20,000 nodes out here and 10,000 nodes there. Why do I need to buy more nodes just to have metadata servers? I've got nodes. I run the damn software on my own machines. I don't want to buy more stuff. And he got to thinking about it and, and out hatched this idea of, well, why don't you do user space oriented file systems 
and check your namespace out into your application, make your modifications to the, mo the metadata, and then stick it all back in in batch. And so this became a project called BatchFS at CMU that eventually became a project called IndexFS, which was the thing that won the best paper, which is now uh, called um, DeltaFS. And what, uh, what brought on, what, what was the stocking horse for using that application, that set of software, that prototype set of software? It was this VPIC application. We had this VPIC application, and we were going to have this big machine called Trinity, and it was going to have two petabytes of DRAM, which is still a lot of DRAM um, compared to a lot of other machines out there. And, um, and they wanted to run a run, one trillion particle problem that has a, a, million, uh, a million cells. So it's a particle and cell. And so, um, and they wanted to track where the particles went. So at the end of this application, it tells you what thousand particles were fun, were interesting, were interesting enough to learn more about. So you start this application and you run it and if, you know, it eats up two petabytes of DRAM on 10,000 nodes. And, um, and all these particles are moving around in these cells, and basically every time step, they wanted to try, write down where that particle was every time step. And so their idea was, we'll write a file per particle per time step. Well, that was going to be a trillion files per time step, and this thing runs for tens or hundreds of thousands of time steps, so that was going to be a few files right, to deal with. And so we said, well, that sounds fun, but let's not do that because no one's invented a file system that'll do that yet. Um, and we said we could build you a user space file system that you could, um, you could essentially write into a key value store, but you're still doing opens and writes and closes, but you're really doing key value inserts because the values are very short. It's like 64 bytes per particle. And so that's what we did. We, that's, what, that's what became known as IndexFS, and IndexFS essentially was this user space file system that you linked to in your application, and you did opens, and you did 64 byte writes, and then you did closes all over the place and for a trillion of them every time you turned around, every time step. And what we did is we created essentially a trillion virtual files for this application, one per particle. And each file was a log of where the thing had been, what cell it had been in. And so we did this, and we did this on the fly while the application was writing data, and we did it roughly about 5% overhead of just writing the data out in a raw binary. And so instead of dumping it out in binary and having to figure this out in big blobs, we wrote it out in records, and we, um, and we tracked in each one of those files. Was virtual files was a log. Now, of course, it wasn't really a file. It was a virtual file that was made up of records in a, in a, in a key value store. And it turns out that the key value store was highly distributed. There was about 10,000 key value stores glued together to make it look like one key value store. Um, but anyway, that's how it worked. And so um, what happened is we ran this application with this software underneath it. And, um, and this, of course, is what I just talked about. It's Delta FS runs in the application itself. And it actually runs 10,000 copies of LevelDB. LevelDB is a, uh, is a log structured merge tree key value store. And it wrote out. Um, so each one of those instances was writing out records into the key value store, which ends up being files on Lustre. Um, and the files on Lustre um, are blobs of records. So I think millions of records in one blob. So, so the file system doesn't see much traffic. It just sees these big files. But the, the application thinks it's writing lots and lots of little files. Um, and this is what happened to the, the simulation. The, the difference between running the application, dumping large blocks, and dumping it using our, our pipelined key value store thing was the difference between the red and the blue there. That, that was the overhead that it costs as we scaled out in millions of particles. And, um, and this is the difference when you, would, when, it, when you finally, at the end of the ca calculation, you get these thousand particles and you say, okay, tell me where they've been. And if you do it the old way, looking through big blobs of data, it takes a long time because you're looking through petabytes of data to find your, you know, figure out where these particles have been. And if you do it this way, all you've really got to do is go do some queries against those key value stores and presto, I'll pop the answers. And that's what this represents. And so um, as the thing gets bigger, of course, it gets worse. And so we sped up the analysis part of this workflow by about a factor of something like 1,000, I think, because 
we thought records instead of blobs. We thought uh, record-oriented I.O. instead of blob-oriented I.O. or object-oriented I.O. or, or if big file-oriented I.O. It was basically records that they were writing. Um, and again, this one, best paper. Um, the interesting thing about it is we were getting about 8 billion particle file ops per second by doing this. So, of course, you're, when you're start, trying to store a trillion of them, it takes a while, so you need to do that many. But um, that's a pretty interesting number, um, pretty large number. And um, this was re a really big success, at least it was the beginning of a success. And then, of course, the application programmer said, that was really cool, but can't you do this, right? <laughs> and, um, and that turned out to be very interesting as well. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Actually, I'll tell you about that right now. So. Um, Another interesting project we have is this thing called HXHIM, which is really a bad name. Um, it's for hierarchical indexing middleware, a multi-dimensional hierarchical indexing middleware. Um, this started about a decade ago. Steve Poole and I were sitting in a break at Salishan, and I started waving my arms and screaming and saying, why the hell, where did vSAM go? Why are we doing all these idiot files when we could do record I.O.? What the heck, why not do that? vSAM was pretty cool in the day. Let's have a parallel vSAM. And that's essentially what DOD funded us to do. And we built this thing called MDHIM out of it. And essentially, it's a multi-dimensional vSAM that's parallel. It's an index store, a key value index store that's parallel. And it's uh, interesting because it's embeddable, and you can link it into your application. So it's got this concept of user space-oriented metadata. Um, so how does it work? It's very similar to what I just described. Each, uh, in your application, you, you can launch threads that are um, metadata servers, that are, are in, um, ISAM or, or key value store servers. Each one of those runs an LSM tree of some kind. We're using an actual, actually an OCT tree. Um, and, um, and the way you, you put the records out there is you shard the, the key. So you take the keys and you shard up the space, and that way you know which records to send to which things. And so the, store, the storage servers are sharded over the key space. And, and it has this thing called bulk insert and bulk get. And the reason why it has that is because each application can, do, can send 100 or 1,000 or a million records to a server if it figures out, oh, those are all in this key range. They all go over there, which saves you a ton of RPCs. Um, and anyway, the software exists. It's being used in several places, but um, that's how it works. And what is it really for? Well, it was, it's kind of for, you know, the VPEC application, the guy said after we gave him his, really quickly, his where had the thousand particles been, the, the VPEC guy said, hey, you know, um, I'd really like to know what was going on around those particles when they were where they were at. Why, are, why is this interesting? Not just where has it been, but what was happening around it. And that became very difficult. Why? Because it became a multi-dimensional index, not just an index over on where it was, but index on things like pressures and neutron densities and things like that. And those things don't shard very well. That's, you know, those things aren't easily, um, the, the key distribution isn't very uh, flat, and so it's very hard to shard. So anyway, this, this application, this, this, we're, this uh, piece of software was designed to help with that. And the stocking horse for that turned out to be a, a wave through time, and this this represents an, an AMR application. If you don't, AMR is where the mesh refines every time step. So you can see up here um, that the mesh is refining every time step. You know, it changes the, changes where it's at, and it changes how refined it is, and so forth. And if you're trying to set up a, a set of keys that are distributed across a set of servers, and you're trying to do it by where things are at, where are things at? because they change all the time, right? So how do you even reference where they're at? That's a hard problem to start with. And then if you're trying to do this in a multi-dimensional way, um, how hard is that to do and how would you do that? Um, key value seems like the right answer, but it's not very multi-dimensional by its very nature. So how did we solve the where are things at problem? We stole from literature. Uh, Microsoft did this project called Farsight a long time ago, and essentially it was a variable length key where they just stuck dots in so that they could, it's like Fortran and, and skipping a few lines and being able to insert things in the middle. Um, that's the, keys, the key sequence um, using this kind of a mechanism was used to, to, to deal with AMR. 
And what are we really trying to do? We're trying to follow a wave, or we're trying to map where a wave goes, or we're trying to you know, look at a wave front and try to figure out you know, where the interesting parts are over the time steps, and, um, and how do you do that? Um, and we think that key value stores are the way to go. We think that um, uh, multi-dimensional key value stores are gonna be, have to be used in this, in this way, and so you're talking about foreign keys and you know, database concepts that are hard, joins and things like that that are hard to do. If you wanna know more about this, talk to me later. I um, think I'll move on to the next topic, Goofy. So we um, had this problem that we have all these disparate storage systems at Los Alamos, um, an archive and a campaign store and a bunch of scratch file systems and home and project spaces and things like that. And they're all sort of not totally POSIX, but kind of POSIX in that they're folder based. And we said, how, do, you know, how can we encourage users to manage their data when they can't even figure out where their data is because it's spread out all over these you know, places? Um, and we looked around for, for solutions in this space, and there's some interesting solutions in this space for how do you take metadata out of storage systems and stick them into databases for you to find things. But most of those solutions are based on um, flattening the, the space, flattening the namespace, and sharding it. And the problem with flattening the namespace and sharding it is you lose the security aspect of the hierarchical nature of the data. So it works great for system administrators, but it doesn't work so well for users. Users need to be able to behave and only see the parts that they can see, and you need the hierarchy for that, and that's hard to do um, when you flatten and shard it. So we looked for a solution that didn't flatten and shard it, and we didn't find one necessarily or anything that we thought was any really great, and so we we wrote our own, and um, that's what I just more or less said. Um, what were the goals? The goals was a unified index over all these disparate storage systems, um, uh, metadata only with extended attribute support, shared index for users and admins, so it has a security thing, parallel, breadth first, parallel search, and incremental updates and things like that. Um, and leveraging as much existing tech as we could do. And so we decided we would um, use POSIX namespaces to store the shape of the tree because nothing in, has ever been invented that's any better than that. And we decided to use embedded databases to store the file metadata, um, SQLite, which turns out to be really cool. And, th and if you look on your phone, half the apps use it, so it must be pretty stable. Um, and so essentially that's what we did. And the way it looks is you've got this tree and it replicates the tree of the storage systems that we have. So we've got slash search and then we've got this would be like scratch one and scratch two and scratch three or whatever. Um, and that has the, it, we replicate the tree and all the permissions. But instead of having files and file entries, we have metadata, a database entries into a, a database. There are three tables. There's an entries table, which is for the files and the links. There's a directories table for the direct for summary information about the directory, like how many files are in this directory, how many bytes are in this directory, how many files are bigger than a bread box, all that kind of stuff, right? And then we also have tree summary um, tables that we can stick in these, these databases, and we can stick those in anywhere we want in the tree, and it represents the entire tree below it. So essentially, it's a roll-up of the information um, about how many files are bigger than whatever, rolled up so you can get a huge benefit from walking the tree in parallel and looking at these things and not having to walk any further down because you know nothing exists um, below this. It's important um, for your query. And it, and it behaves really, really well for, um, for users because it just behaves like a POSIX tree and you get the permissions and, that, and the like. Um, I won't take you through what all the utilities are, but the goals are really something like, um, we, at Los Alamos, we probably have something like 10 billion files right now. And so we'd like to be able for a system administrator to work, um, to look through that in a few minutes, say five minutes or less. And we'd like for any user who might have a few hundred million files to get something in a few seconds. And um, this laptop that sort of doesn't work, that's where these numbers came from. Um, so I built a 250 million file um, file system and put a goofy into it and then deleted the file system because there wasn't enough space left. Um, and these are the numbers we got, so two minutes for, for uh, a quarter of a billion files on a little Mac, which turns out to be okay. We've Recently we've put this on a, a halfway decent machine with some SATA um, 
flash, which isn't great, but, um, and we're getting um, about 800 million um, a minute. Um, so we're getting close to the numbers we need. Um, and, and it's interesting because essentially you just type in sort of SQL-like things, right? Find me all the files that are bigger than this and smaller than that and older than this and have this in the name and I put an extended attribute like this on them. And that's, that's the results you get and so that's that. I think that's the end and I'm right on time at zero and it's all open source. It's all BSD licensed so you can take it and make money with it if you'd like. Um, just don't blame us if it doesn't work. And... Um, and actually, I was at Los Alamos at this time, but that's not me. 